Always a good time, John. If you were wearing your t-shirt, I would have worn mine. We could have matched. There we go. So as usual, I'm going to take over the screen quick and start with just a little clip. But again, Zoom doesn't love all the, the music so much, but the clips are back on our website as well. Here's a little clip. <laughs> So that kind of gives you a little taste and I think also kind of explains why um, the Daughter of the Regiment also has a very strong showing with Bastille Days. It has kind of this very March pompous, like fun music that um, it's been often brought back like just like an encore show on Bastille Days in France ever since its premiere. And, um, um, but we're gonna talk a little bit about Donizetti. Um, so right now we're kind of, Donizetti was born in 1797 and not a very long life, 1848. And so um, he's kind of in this period that we call the Bel Canto period. Um, we, the, those of you that were with us for um, the Barber of Seville, that was kind of that period of time too. So the big three here is Donizetti, Bellini, and um, Rossini. And then we get a little bit of early Verdi, but it's all about the voice. And a little bit about Donizetti. He was the youngest of three uh, of a caretaker of the municipal pawn shop. I don't know, I found that interesting. Um, but then in a, he went on to Bologna and what they said is actually he was not very good singer, but they saw in him some musicality that is like, and so they, they sent him on to Bologna and he became really, really good at counterpoint and fugue writing. And so, Right around 1818, he started writing music. His first opera, um, not that you should know it, I didn't know it when I read it, Enrico di Borgogna, um, it was his first opera. And he doesn't really find any success until about 1830. But in that time, he wrote 31 operas, if you can believe that. So in 12 years, he wrote 31 operas. And then um, he, Bellini's kind of take it, Bellini slash Rossini has kind of taken all of the popularity at this time. But in 1830, he wrote Anna Bolena and is kind of like, and that's kind of when we're like, oh, let's pay attention to Donizetti. And then he tears it up for the next two decades, basically. Um, two years later, he wrote Le Lesir d'Amour. Um, by 1835, he's written Lucia de Lamamor. And so over the course of his very short life, he wrote over 70 operas in Italian and in French. Um, and unlike some, like when I think of like Rossini, and correct me if you can think of one that's more serious, Maggie, but I'm like, Rossini was all comedy. And then if you're thinking Bellini, Bellini was all drama. Donizetti is known for both. He had this knack, he has very good musicality for theater and he could do an opera, the dramas, Anna Bolena, um, Le Chie de l'Amour, as well as the comedies, like today we have La Fille de Regiment, um, Le Azir Amour, and Dom Pasquale. You wanna add a little bit here, Maggie, <laughs> anytime you... I will, you know, it's, you are doing such a great job. I thought I'm just gonna sit back and relax and pretend I have a Manhattan. <laughs> um, no, you know, he's, he's an interesting guy because he, he was very easygoing. He was a nice guy. I mean, when I picture a workaholic, I kind of think of Steve Jobs or, you know, someone really intense and, and, you know, you reflect on what kind of a person is easygoing and can write 30 operas that nobody wants to hear or says are good and just keeps going. I mean, he just keeps plugging along and, you know, bless his heart, as the Southerners would say, but really, I, as his parent or spouse, I can only imagine the frustration of watching him learn his craft through doing. Um, but what he, what he did do when he got there is created these pieces that 
for a point in time actually were considered old fashioned. They have a very specific feel to them and they are certainly um, a more um, kind of encapsulated story, right? There's silliness, you're unmasking the lost mother of so-and-so and, -so, and you're, the man you fell in love with is actually so-and-so, right? So they're, they've got these plot twists that are operatic and in any other art form just wouldn't work. The audience would sit there bored out of their mind. And yet the way that he weaves these in musically keep you engaged on the edge of your seat and they are fun and bubbly. And I, I kind of picture Fille de Regiment as, Fille de Regiment as um, like almost a glass of champagne. It's, it's got a lot of energy to it. There's constant motion and the characters are fun to play. And I know I, I emphasize that a lot. There's some shows where the character is deep and profound and you're trying to communicate the depth of their despair, that kind of thing. For a light voiced soprano, and we've talked a little bit about different voice types, how big they are, how small they are, um, what repertoire fits the, the various people, right? It's a little Cinderella in the shoe. This, this lady's foot would fit in the shoe, okay? She's got a little peachy, beautiful, gorgeous soprano voice that can, you know, do the fireworks and go all over the place. And at the same time, instead of being treated like a doll, which in some operas, like Hoffman, she's literally a doll, um, she gets to be this rambunctious, um, pants wearing, which again, there aren't a lot of roles for that voice type where you get to do that. Um, full spitfire character who's been raised by men and knows her mind and gets to speak it and is backed up by an army. And that's really fun to do on stage. And the freedom that you can hear, um, at John, I love the clip that you picked, the freedom you can hear in her expression of that joy is so in the music. So Natalie Desai is an incredible performer. She certainly um, knows her craft very well, but the music itself, as he put it together, does such a great job of letting us see who this character is and um, allows the singer to really release it rather than have to create it anew every time they do it is really fun. And as you get to know this opera a little bit, and again, in my mind, all of you Google for like five minutes after our book clubs and check out the fun clips, but you know, there's, there's some beautiful moments, there's some poignant moments. He does a great job of really creating a little conflict, but it's like cute baby conflict. And you somehow know deep down that nobody who writes music like this would ever leave it um, torturous and unresolved. That's not to say that he doesn't know how to do that. And in fact, if you dive into some of Donizetti's heavier repertoire, um, one of his most famous scenes is Lucia's mad scene, and that is as far as you can get from bubbly and champagne, you know, spitfire in front of an army, whole different kettle of fish. But um, when he goes comedic, he really knows how to take it and bring us along and sweep us along with that joy. So when you're listening to the clips from this, look for how much movement there is in the voices and in the sounds. And then, and I'm sure, jo I'm gonna let John, our, our house tenor, tell you about the tenor, but. Um, let's just say he likes to play to the extremes of the voice, shall we? Um, so this opera is very famous for one little vocal trick that we'll save, we'll save for the end because it's a, it's a doozy. Um, that said, though, this piece and John, I would love for you to share the Berlioz story. I just think that's so funny. Oh, absolutely this hit the market, and it hit at a time when Italian opera was hot in France and. I mean, keep in mind, this is like writing musicals, right? Just for some context. So if there was a show that played really well, it was probably gonna get played other places. And um, that was a big deal in a non-global economy, right? So for a show to move country to country in a time when we don't have cell phones, we don't have, um, you know, people are sending letters. I saw a great show yesterday and three weeks later, maybe the receiver will be like, oh, there's something good playing in London. Um, so that's a big deal. The fact that when he did hit popularity, it hit so suddenly and so strongly that his shows were being played everywhere. Um, it really matters. And I think the emotionality of it is where that comes from. So John has a story about somebody who was less excited about this opera. Well, I, I'm going to 
preface it by um, Maggie said earlier that like old fashioned, and that was kind of a criticism that we would talk about. And we are kind of in this kind of bubble pop of opera idol is what I'll call it. Because even by the time they're in Paris, there's kind of uh, with Rossini backing it up like a contest between Bellini and Donizetti to see who has the best show. Bellini wins, but it's actually his last show, his master, one of his masterpieces. So he deserved to win, but Donizetti was a gracious loser because he was just an all around pleasant guy. But at the premiere in 1840, um, so 1838, Donizetti is kind of blowing up Paris. And by blowing up Paris, it means every opera house in town is doing either a new work of his an old work of his in Italian or a work of his in Italian that they've now translated and are doing a French version of his, of his opera. And so upon the premiere, Berlioz, so this, I believe this name came up with Strauss because this is like Symphony Fantastique. And he was all about like, in music history, you're kind of a giant if you've changed harmonics and and so we think of the big ones like Beethoven, like it's like music changed with him. And they get, I don't know, they get this big like footnote in all of the chapter books. And so anything that- I'm going to interrupt for one second. Believe it's because they really changed the orchestration. So when you're yeah. changing the sound of the colors underneath, you do, you get this extra like plus 10 to your score because you have suddenly changed how everyone can hear colors, orchestral colors under the singers. So. Dive back in, John. <laughs> and so Berlioz, who is a composer, but at this time he's also a critic, which is kind of a very thing, big thing happening in the 19th century. You're a composer, you're a critic, you're a writer of this, and you're doing everything. Um, and he, he saw, and he was already upset. I'm going to preface it like, he's like, Monsieur Donizetti seems to treat us like a conquered country. One can no longer speak of the opera houses of Paris, but only the opera houses of Monsieur Donizetti. So that's, that's where he's starting his critique from. So he's already pissed off, excuse my language, that, that he's not getting in any of the opera houses. Everything is Donizetti. And then he follows it up by saying, and mind you, the, the critique is quite long, but I'm giving you paraphrasing. Um, the score of Le Fille de Regiment is not all, all one that is either composer of public takes seriously. There is harmony, some melody, some rhythmic effects, some instrumental and vocal combination. It is music, if one will, but not new music. <laughs> so that, that's where Berlioz felt after the premiere. Um, he had some feelings. <laughs> but That's like how I talk to my kids. He had big feelings. <laughs> but despite that, it went on to perform 40 more times within um, uh, the, that next year, right after the premiere. And then I, I, I didn't cliff note it in my notes today, but I think it was like it had its 500th performance probably within 50 years. It had its thousand. Nine, 1908 was its thousand. Yeah. Thousands performance at the Opéra Comique in Paris. So, so as you can see, it has definitely stood the test of time. <laughs> I've, I'm going to read you the Cliff Notes version I wrote in our opera blog just to give you kind of an idea about this show. So it's kind of, it's very much like Maggie said, The Soprano is, um, was adopted by the regiment and has kind of been raised as a boy like one of the boys in it and so that's kind of how she, how she she has a whole bunch of bluster pants and that's how she um lives life as a tomboy all through and through so baby girl marie is found on the battlefield and is raised by soldiers as their daughter she falls in love with a civilian tonio he becomes a soldier because that's kind of what all of her dads because the whole regiment adopted her um so that she can marry him or that they can be together. Marie's aunt, though simultaneously, Marquis of Birkenfield, cl claims her as her niece. She takes Marie home to her to teach her how to be a sophisticated girl because she wants to marry her off to the Duke of Crockenthorpe. Great names. Um, <laughs> however, um, the Marquis, who is actually, we find out, 
it's kind of very Gilbert and Sullivan before Gilbert and Sullivan. Find out that the Marquis is actually Marie's mom and she sees how in love Marie is with Tonio. And so she's like, oh, we're not going to make you get married. Even though Marie is like, I'm going to follow through because I owe it to you and allows Tony, it's a happy ending. So it kind of wraps itself up nice and neat with a tight little bow. Um, but as Maggie said, one of the, outside of all these wonderful little clips and very fun moments throughout the whole show, there's too many to mention, is a major, major tenor aria called, um, uh, oh my God, I'm going blank. Uh, Amaze Ami. Amaze Ami. <laughs> and the main thing about Amaze Ami is there are eight high C's written throughout the course of this opera. And so that you know, a high C is a big dang deal because it takes a lot of work for a tenor to get up there. Um, it's, a, it's a big deal for a soprano to sing up there, but I think it, it's kind of a, another, another big leap to do for a tenor, especially um, to do it once in, in a number, let alone eight. And a lot of times, um, as you'll hear in this clip, I have La um, Lawrence Brownlee. They will do an optional ninth high C at the very just end to of show the off. <laughs> yep. And then just to have a good time, a lot of times after the show is done, they will reprise it and the tenor will come back and sing an additional nine high Cs. So like 18 high Cs for the day. Uh, but it has launched careers. Pavarotti was making a name for himself. I'm sure he was doing just fine. But then he did Daughter of the Regiment um, opposite of Joan Sutherland and Ameza um, Meep launched his career into like super hyperdrive, world renowned star. Um, let me share this clip with you. I got changed. Here we go. Now he's just showing off. <laughs> So as you, it, it's always a thriller at the, um, with this, this show all together. Um, I also want to talk there, like what is really, really fun, especially for opera houses around the world, is there's a non-singing role. Oh, pause, two seconds. Yeah. Before you do that, I just want to make a comment about how you approach a note. Um, because that's a big part of this show for me as well, as you're, as you're watching that feat um, to show you how difficult it is. The way some composers write, they, they are gentle with you and they give you uh, a high note that's easy to, to reach and then kind of bounce you up and let you come back down. So it's like a little, it's like a step stool, right? To help you get to the high note. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but for these high Cs, you don't get a step stool. You've got to just launch yourself over and over again. And most singers have a tendency to really kind of whack a note if you have to make that big of a jump. So technically in your body to sing those notes well, and obviously Lawrence Brownlee is an absolute God. He sings them beautifully. It, it requires constant work on your support, a constant flexibility, reminding yourself to ground your body and not go up with the note. And the minute you get through it, you've got to start getting ready for the next one. And that piece just keeps going. And all of the approaches are the same way. So you're doing these giant leaps up to one of the hardest notes you're going to get to in your entire repertoire over and over again over an orchestra. So when we say that it's physically difficult to do and it's a real feat for a tenor to accomplish, that's part of it is it's not, okay, I can blow my wad on one note. It's, oh my gosh, I've got to just, it's, you know, I don't know who likes skating. I tend to watch it, but my ankles collapse when I try to do it. So for me, those are like magical people too. Um, it's like the triple sow cow, right? You do one, you don't try to do extras. That's when people fall down. This is the equivalent of putting in too many triple sow cows and somehow they pull it off. So <laughs> if you ever get to see this show live, 
when it gets to this aria, take a minute and I would highly encourage you to watch their body and their feet because some singers will actually bounce on their toes when they go up for high notes like this. And some of them, you can see their entire torso change shape as they sit into their support, which really fills your entire belly area. You will watch it change shape and hold its shape as people sustain that note. And really it's called a puja. That's when you um, really, as you take a deep breath and you're letting that air out, it's, it's the pressure that happens in your body as you resist um, letting that air out of your body, very simply, but it's the, the foundation of all good singing. So if you ever have the pleasure of seeing this live, that's what you watch for. You watch to see if they're tippy toe bouncers, which always makes me giggle a little bit, I'm gonna be honest, and whether they are really succeeding in staying in their body, because those people, the ones who can really stay in their body where you see their torsos, um, those are the people who have long careers because they're, they're using their support, they're not pushing too hard in their chords, and for an opera singer to have a multi-decade career, that's what it takes is that really strong technique. So, John, go on. Yeah, for and what I would even add to that, because it's, it's going up there, and I think you can only know it as a tenor, is um, if you watch Lawrence Brownlee, um, he gets his air, and like especially the first time he approaches it, like if you watch the whole aria, he blows out half of his air because it's like this very fine technique that if you have too much air you're going to like pop like a tea kettle and so he like very smartly and he then he goes for it like letting it letting it loose um the other fun part of the show and i i, I want to bring up these because i think so many opera houses are gonna have so much fun, is there's a non-speaking role that is famous for cameos in um, The Daughter of the Regiment. Um, one of my favorites, B. Arthur, Golden Girl fan, um, and Kathleen Turner have like have gone, I'm guessing at the Met stage, I didn't get all of their credits, um, but that Lawrence um, Brownlee was in a production at Washington Opera, um, National Opera, and they had Ruth Bader Ginsburg join them on stage to, to do this, the Duchess of Kronkenforth. And so it's always a great time because it's almost like the, the, whole sh the whole show stops because they're just so excited for whoever is coming on stage. And those of you who didn't know it, um, the Notorious RBG is a big, big opera fan. Um, as well as the late Anthony Scalia. And actually there's an opera written about both of them. And so if you have extra time on your hands, definitely go check it out. It's, it's a great fun and it was premiered in front of them and they, they had a great joy watching that shenanigans happen. Um, but I wanna get to one last trio, but I wanna ask, see if there's any questions before we do it. Cause I just have one more clip that's fun, but yeah. While people are thinking of questions, I'm going to share two comments that came through. I love that I get like trivia notes during these sessions. It's so great. Um, from Ed, the first tenors did not sing that note from the chest. And I'm assuming by that he's talking about them going into falsetto, which is a way to hit a higher note with less body in it, where you're kind of floating your note. Um, it has a, del a more delicate feel to it, which is also beautiful. In, in the way it's performed today, it is this kind of muscular feat of strength and it does use the whole, the whole body. Um, Trust I, the, critic I, would, the critics would come for you if you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah. And then Diane sent me a note. Um, Diane helps us at the Florentine quite regularly. That the last time we did this opera, we had three performances in a row, but we double cast Tonio. And I am not surprised by that at all because this, you, you need a break. <laughs> <laughs> two times in a row, much less three. All right, now questions. Barbara, I see your hand. Okay. Uh -oh. um, I saw Beverly Sills do uh, The Daughter of the Regiment here in Milwaukee. I don't know what year, but uh, she didn't wear pants, long pants. She wore a skirt, a military outfit, and uh, she was so natural. She really related to the audience. It was, I think, at the Paps Theater. And the tenor was so nervous. She explained to us, the tenor is so nervous, and she held his hand throughout his 
of much of the performance. I don't know if it was through that aria, but that's what she did. And she told us she was supporting him that way. Oh, that's really cute. Yes, Emery's? It was, it was in Eline Hall. Beverly Sills was with the Florentine Opera, Maggie. Yeah, yeah. I knew that. I was very excited about that. It was so <laughs> exciting for us. Yes. What year was it? I don't remember. I was going to say, we have, we have the year. I have that written down somewhere. For those of you who don't know me or, or haven't known me before, I have been in my role for about 15 months. So I continue to learn things about the Florentine from Florentine fans who have been here way longer than I have. So thank both of you. That's great. I love it. Anything else, Catherine? Catherine? I, I noticed that the names of the uh, other characters are German and um, <laughs> And the uh, officers appear to be in German uniforms. The, I think the French maybe like to make fun of the Germans. You know, the Germans are pretty funny. <laughs> so. Strong rivalries there. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any research to back up why the names are, are of German descent, but I, I'm, I'm guessing you're right. It's easier to make fun of something, somebody that's further away from you, especially <laughs> in the town. <laughs> Barbara? Uh, the name Kronkenfor, is that the name? Duchess of Kronkenfor? Kronkenfor is one of the names, yep. It, it, Kronk means sick. So I don't know what, is it Thor or, or Thorpe? I couldn't quite hear what it was. Anyway, that would be funny, a funny yeah. name. <laughs> but in the, clip, in the clip that John showed, the, the officers looked like they were wearing German style uniforms. Yeah. No, and there's there's been some other wonderful. If you um, have a chance, the Met just recently redid this again with um, a wonderful South African soprano, Pretty Yendi. And an amazing thing is because French, uh, with um, her native um, language of Zulu, she was able to incorporate Zulu into some of like her. Like she gets all frustrated and she goes from French into Zulu, and it almost you'd miss it, but it was just really she's cool. Wonderful. Yeah. We've got that on the website too. And if you're going to watch any clip right after that, I highly recommend you check hers out because it is, it is just remarkable. So, all right, everyone. Any last questions? You guys, this is always such a pleasure. And I hope you've enjoyed talking about the daughter of the regiment. It always puts me in a great mood. I think Christine's got some updates for us for next time. And I hope we'll get to see a lot of you back here. Thank you, everyone. We enjoy this every single week, seeing these happy faces and being able to talk about this. So, so again, on behalf of Florentine Opera and the Rotary Club of Milwaukee, thank you so much for joining us. First timers or those who continue to join us whenever you can, we love this. Uh, next week coming up, we have John? Thais, I believe. I believe Tosca, yes. Oh. Oh. Am I right? So we'll be diving into one of the grand days. Of yeah. For those of you who are not regulars, Tosca is one of the, the top operas done around the world. And it is, um, for those of you who have been here before, one of those Verismo operas. It's kind of Puccini's version of Verismo. And it is intense and passionate. And I am pretty sure you have heard some of the music before. So I hope you'll join us as we explore that. And we look forward to seeing you back here. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone. See you next week. <laughs>